Am I on? Everybody hear me in the back? Raise your hand if you can't hear me. <laughs> Louder. My name is Heidi Waterhouse, and I am a technical documentarian of almost 20 years now. And I have a talk that is in direct contrast to the other talks that you have already heard this morning. And it's about the chaotic environment and how to bring a little order to it and uh, impose some structure on it. By the time we get to this point in our career, most of us have specialized in one kind of uh, thing or another. Like we've specialized in security or we've specialized in a particular type of writing tool or we've specialized in an organization type. We might be startup people or we might be big enterprise people. But we have a thing that we do. My particular specialty is walking into a company that has never had a technical documentation person before and getting them sort of straightened out and then riding off into the sunset. <laughs> I imagine myself as a sheriff walking into a lawless western town. I'm like, I stride in and my, my spurs are jingling and my badge is shiny and I'm like, I'm here to bring you some law and order because you need it now. You have gotten to the point where you're too big to just operate without it. So the first thing you want to do is get a star. And the only star you really get is by being hired. You have now convinced the hiring manager that you are smart enough to handle their big thorny problem of not having any real documentation. And you're just going to have to hold that in your heart because no one else is going to believe in you. If they believed in documentation, they'd already have somebody doing it. <laughs> so you're going to have to overcome all of your imposter syndrome and all of your feelings like you don't know how to start documentation and just do it and believe that someone somewhere hired you to do this job. You're here because you can bring value to the job. You're here because you're an expert and you need to make sure that people understand that you have the authority to get the documentation out of their heads and onto paper. The next thing we're going to do is have trouble with our slides. <laughs> the next thing we're going to do is set up shop. You open the old dusty sheriff's office or possibly it's an adjunct to the saloon and you walk in and the first thing that happens when you start a new job is people show you around, right? They're like, this is Heidi, she's the new writer. Everybody goes, oh, a writer. <laughs> what I want you to do when you're doing this is make a map of the cubicles or chairs or desks that you're looking at with the names of people on them and what they specialize in. Because I don't know about you, but when I meet 20 new people, I remember none of them. I'm lucky if in the first three weeks I can remember my boss's name. Like, oh good, it's on an email. <laughs> I guess I know who you are. But if you make a map of people and their specialties, you can refer back to this in three weeks or six weeks when somebody says, oh, go talk to Janet, she knows about SQL. Well, now you know where Janet sits and you're not wandering around going, are you Janet? How about you? <laughs> it makes you look a lot more expert if you're like, hey, Janet, talk to me about the SQL thing. You want to draw a map of your existing documentation. And it seems funny that there would be documentation if there isn't a documenter, but there always is. There's always some weird little wiki that a developer has created. There's always some white paper that marketing has. There's always some bizarre conglomeration of poorly formatted documents somewhere. You need to draw a map to them and you need to make sure that you have access to them because people frequently forget to give you access to everything that you need because they don't realize that being a technical documentation person means that you have to see everything in the company. Like, maybe we'll leave out salaries, but otherwise you need to touch it all. And while you're waiting for them to set up your laptop and your permissions, you should get to know the neighborhood. Like, stop and read your competitors' documents. Almost none of us are working in a field so green that nobody else is doing what, we have, what we're doing. So I work for Dell and Stratius. We do multi-cloud management. So I went out and looked at who did cloud management and who, looked at, who did multi-cloud management, and I read some of the infinite multitude of Amazon Web Services documents so that I knew what kind of environment I was getting into before I started asking really stupid questions. You can ask stupid questions, but it's nice if they're not the really stupid questions. <laughs> I have a 
business card that says better and cheaper than having your developer write it. And whenever I hand it out, <laughs> I get this response, right? Because it turns out that developers will write things, but it's expensive for them to do it because they can't be coding while they're doing it. Oh, sad. <laughs> and it's better to have somebody who has specialized in writing to do the writing. Marketing people don't always write code, and developers don't always write documentation, and I write a really hacky web page. I've just accepted this. So now that you've been hired to be a specialist, embrace that and say, look, this is what I'm taking away from you. So once you're there, you need to draw fast. Your documentation doesn't do any good if nobody is looking at it. And if somebody goes around you while you're getting all figured out, they're not going to trust that you're here to solve their problem. So you take out your, your trusty six gun and you draw fast. You don't have any time for frills. I have done early documentation in Notepad. I have done early documentation in straight HTML. I have, while waiting for the purchasing process to come through, done documentation on uh, uh, sample products, like trial products, which is a little awkward if they don't let you save. That's Sometimes you have to do a little hacking. <laughs> but the important thing for me is to deliver really early and show people that it's going to be valuable for them. I like to uh, say that you're going to get precision between emergencies. So your precision is things like formatting and um, readability and localization and some really important things, but you can't get to those if nobody trusts you to put out the fire first. So you're going to have to think about what the most emergent emergency is and address that. The next thing we're going to do is save the townspeople. There's been a marauding group of bandits, possibly. Um, <laughs> So the first thing to do to save the people is address their biggest internal pain point. When I started work at uh, Ability Network, I walked in and started talking to the customer support people. And then one day I noticed them receiving faxes that were full of teeny tiny little rows of forms with hand-lettered 10-digit numbers in them. And I'm like, what's that? They're like, oh, that's the customer ID number. We can't do anything without the customer ID number. And we misread it really often because they're teeny tiny hand-lettered numbers. I'm like, so wait, you have to get faxes with the hand-lettered numbers to let you do your job? And they're like, yeah, that's how it goes. So the first thing I did was spend half an hour creating a PDF form that they could send out and get back. I didn't even make it smart enough to go into a database. It was just they could actually copy and paste out of it. And that saved them two hours a day up front. Ever after that, customer support was always on my side, no matter what I wanted. <laughs> They're like, no, no, she's good. We can, we can do this. Um, so doing that original pain point thing wins friends, influences people, and quiets your own imposter syndrome so you don't feel like you're useless in the first three months because you haven't accomplished anything while you're learning this massively complicated new piece of software. The next thing you want to do is give people a structure to ask about things and a way to give feedback. And my favorite way to do this is use an existing structure, which is bug tracking. I declare that all documentation is equivalent to code, and it needs to be published with code, and it needs to be pushed with code, and all the bugs need to be assigned to me as code bugs so that I can fix them and track them, and I have visibility and accountability. Because I do this, everyone can see where the problems are and what I'm working on, and I have a nice little checklist, like when I've done writing massive conceptual documents on days that I'm just not that smart, I can go through and check off little bugs. And some developers, some customer support people, they will, they will nitpick you to death. They're like, did you really mean to put a period there instead of a semicolon? Really, guys? <laughs> but you'll also get extremely valuable feedback on what is inaccurate and what is not working for them. So that's the internals. The externals, for a while I worked at Microsoft, 
And if you ever wondered if people read those little forms that are at the bottom of TechNet articles where you say, um, was this useful to you or do you wish it had something else? The answer is yes. We read them and get evaluated on them and then we add them to our work list and go back and improve them. I know it feels like nothing ever changes, but there's a lot of TechNet art articles. Um, and that, that free flow of information back and forth really makes you feel like a more effective person. Not all documents are for everyone. But if you can't identify which audience you're serving with the document, you're writing the wrong document. If you can't visualize which townsperson you are saving with this particular document, then you're probably not saving anyone. You're probably just wasting time. The next thing you want to do is check for scorpions. And when I first wrote this, I was thinking about people that I had had conflicts with when I'd walked into jobs earlier. Oops, sorry. Thank you. Oh, just for a minute. I'm sorry. Um, so you're going to want to check for scorpions, which are situations and not people. Because if you start blaming people, they'll start blaming you, and you just have this terrible political problem. So what you want to do is look for hoarded documentation. I have a developer who I appreciate deeply. And he was the guy who wrote all of the existing documentation. And he wrote it in an impenetrable and inaccessible product. And I try not to believe that he did that on purpose. <laughs> I'm not sure, but we're, we're going to go with the best possible explanation of he liked it. Um, but he's really reluctant to let it go because he spent a ton of energy and effort on it. And he's worried that I'm not technical enough to understand what's going on because he's been working on the product five years and I've been here less than a year. So I understand why he's concerned about that. And yet I look at it and I go, That's, that structure is not really what I would have done. The, uh, another thing that I have to worry about is stuff from the last sheriff. I'm talking as if there's never been someone doing documentation before, but that's not always true. Sometimes there was a previous person and they have left behind feelings about technical documentation, and sometimes cryptic, arcane, encrypted files, and sometimes, I don't know, weird trash that appears on the computer that you get. And you need to look at that and see if any of it's useful to you. And you also need to look and see if you need to do damage control for how they've treated the team in the past. The next thing I do is I take all those people who are hoarding the documentation and I think of them as vigilantes. They're really interested in law, order, and good documentation, but they're sort of operating outside the bounds of the law. So the, the way to bring them in, to gather them in, is to deputize them and say, hey, that was great documentation you did. I'm going to roll it into my tool, which actually does localization, and you're going to help me keep updating it, and I want you to always proof it. Like, you're in charge of making sure that I'm accurate on this. By deputizing them, you make it feel less like you're ripping their baby from their arms and more like you're becoming a collaborative team. I uh, found out last week that there's an entire training section in my company that I didn't know about. And I said, <laughs> I'm like, so where, where'd that come from? And uh, he said, well, I've been working on it for about half a year. And I'm like, OK, that's pretty good. It's, it's pretty good. I might not have written it in pure HTML with Elasticsearch, but OK. <laughs> you're, you're kind of a dev guy. And um, I was kind of mad. I was like, why wouldn't anyone tell me about this? I said, what percentage of your time are you spending on this? He said, oh, I'm 100% dedicated to it. I'm like, I, I came here as a technical writer, and nobody told me there was another technical writer. But he didn't think of himself as a technical writer. He thought of himself as a customer support third tier person who was writing all the implementation document. And so he never thought of himself as part of the team. So now I've deputized him and I said, you're part of the team. Here's all the awesome things about being the team. Also give me all your source code. <laughs> <laughs> it worked out OK. The last thing we're going to do is build infrastructure. 
Once you have put out some of the fires, you want to settle into everyday life in a cadence so you have more resources to devote to building a structure so that you're not in reinventing the wheel or the saloon every time you need a drink. You want to write templates and structure and things that you can stub out and drop things into so that you're not working as hard. You have worked very hard in the first three to six months and months six to nine is more like building out. The town newspaper is your release notes. Let people know what you're doing on a regular basis. Go to the product demos, go to the scrum meetings. Be sure that documentation is seen as an integral part of the product and not a tacked on cost center. One of the things I do is go to the release meetings and say, so exactly when were we going to incorporate documentation with that? I was just wondering, are we going to push with the code or do I have a couple days afterwards since I'm just changing the text within these files and not the files themselves? And frequently the response I'll get is like, right, yeah, we're going to do that all together. Um, but if I didn't show up to the meetings, it would never occur to anyone that documentation is part of the code and the deliverable. You set up a telegraph to talk to other sheriffs. Frequently, if you are the new sheriff in town, the Greenfield documentarian, you are alone. You have nobody else to talk to, and it's really isolating. So you need to set up a telegraph line to other sheriffs. This is an example of how we're communicating with each other, and find peers that are going to support you when you have rants that are specific to technical documentation. One of the signs that a town has grown from happenstance into a place where people are planning to live is something called platting. In a plat, founders designate spaces for schools and graveyards, parks and civic institutions, even universities. Every organization has varying needs, but there are significant plat sections that you can look at and make sure that you've covered in your creation of this town. You want to know that customers can use your, your product. You want to know that whoever is installing your product can configure it. You want to know that advanced users can customize your product. Frequently this is stuff like API documentation. So it's not for everybody, but you want to know that they can use the, do or use the product in the way that they need to use it. You want to know that everyone can fix problems when something goes wrong. If you don't have a way to solve problems, people will create it on their own. They'll go to your user board or to Stack Overflow and they'll write it on their own and then you can steal it back from them. <laughs> but uh, it's better to provide them fixes in the first place. And you're going to need a reference guide because eventually it will get too big for you to remember all the things that are switches and knobs and buttons. And some people would rather just look up that one thing than have to go through all of documentation to find it. You need an extremely searchable reference guide. Plan for succession. You may win the lottery or you may get shot by banditos or laid off. Any of these things could happen. Please don't have all of your technical documents on your personal computer and your locked repository because the next person who comes in is going to hate you forever. Remember that you are part of the code base and you need to be versioning and submitting and publicizing exactly the same as they are. Because someone someday is going to have to come in and pick up where you left off. Another thing, the last thing that I think you should think about is Sheriffs are part of a town. They live in the town. They send their kids to school. They're really invested in it. Texas Rangers ride into town, shoot the bad guy, and leave. You should think about whether you want to be a sheriff or a Texas Ranger. I'm evolving from Texas Ranger into sheriff, where I'm spending longer and longer at companies once I've set them up. But I had a great career where I would spend 8 to 12 months with a company, get them straightened out, and then leave. It's a valid career option, and if you want to talk to me about it, I would be happy to speak to you about it. It's a really interesting and exciting way to get to learn a lot of new things. I think greenfield writing is some of the most exciting work there is in our industry. You get to come up with the architecture and the design and the delivery and everything about how your, your, your technical documentation works. You get to help frustrated newbies and grizzled veterans get their job done, and you get to do it all without any conversion problems. 
<laughs> I'm always happy to talk to you about this specialty, and I hope you will, not, you will ask any questions you have about finding these jobs, starting them out, and not letting them burn you out. This is my contact information. Uh, I think we have a couple minutes for questions. If anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. No questions. Okay, we don't have a couple minutes for questions. Well, nope, nope, you can one, talk to me later. Two. <laughs> let's, so let's do you two, and that'll be it. Thanks, Heidi. I love your analogy. What is Greenfield documentation? Oh, so Mr. Christensen, who talked about permaculture, uh, is sort of working on the opposite side of this. Greenfield is when you walk into a pasture and it hasn't been plowed to be a farm field. It's untouched, it's virgin ground, it's not, there's nothing there. Oh, sorry, um, my question is, is that it sounds like you go into situations sometimes where there's a legacy, like you said, maybe resentment against the person or mm -hmm. some sort of conflict. And um, do you have favorite techniques for breaking down those barriers or sessions that you kind of go through to get the communication going again? Um, frequently, it's the finding their pain point and solving it. Uh, always when I have walked into this situation, what they felt like is that the writer didn't listen to them, that the writer was not paying attention to what they were saying about their expertise in the product. And so the first thing I try and do is be a really good active listener um, I like to sit down with the DevOps people and have them install a working environment for me. Like, not install for me, but walk me through installing a working environment and take notes on it. And when they see me write up how to install a working dev environment, they realize that I've just saved them all of this tedious onboarding for the next five or six people. And, and then they're a lot more cooperative because they realize that I'm actually here to add value to their life. All right. Thank you.